Hello. Then Kenobi fought Darth Vader on the first Death Star before his heroic sacrifice. What if Ben Kenobi saved Darth Vader on the Death Star? Would Vader join the Alliance and fight alongside the Rebels, or would he, because of his war crimes, be subjugated to more pain and suffering? Special thanks to Art Savers for sponsoring our 75,000 subscriber lightsaber giveaway. All the details are in the pinned comment down below. Our story begins on the Death Star. Ben Kenobi broke off from Han, Chewie, Luke, and the droids to go shut down the tractor beam. As long as the systems were shut down, the Falcon would be able to get out of the superstation and jump into hyperspace. Though there was something Ben knew he was doing. He was likely going to run into Darth Vader. The chances of him besting Vader once more were highly unlikely. Mustafar was a game of patience, and so was their duel shortly after the Battle of Jabim. Obi-Wan knew Vader wouldn't be so unwise again. It cost him two of his most embarrassing losses. Once the hyperdrive was shut down, Ben began the search for Vader. By this point, he was fully aware that Darth knew he was here. He could sense the change in the Force, and so Ben walked around the corner, and he found him. He remembered the first time he heard that Anakin Skywalker was still alive. He remembered the first time he laid eyes on the suit, watching Vader rip people down the streets of a small mining town on Mapuzo. This monster was here right in front of him, and as Obi-Wan's belief, Vader was much more steady. He didn't budge, he didn't show overpowering strength, he just waited patiently with his lightsaber already ignited. Obi-Wan saw this Vader and realized that in the 10 years since their last fight, Vader finally learned his lesson. It wasn't a matter of learning Obi-Wan's lightsaber form, it was a matter of internal maturity. Vader was prepared in every possible way for their previous encounter. He mastered Form 3 to ensure he never lost to it again, and when he thought that he had Obi-Wan cornered, his master switched from Form 3 to Form 4. Vader realized in the moment that he was but the learner. Now he would consider himself the master. He would defeat Obi-Wan Kenobi, take his life, and his lightsaber as a trophy and a testament to the death of Anakin Skywalker. It wasn't more than a couple years before then that he killed Ahsoka. He could finish the job here. Though oddly enough, Ahsoka never seemed to be hit by the lightsaber when he killed her. It just seemed like she was killed. Odd. Regardless, Obi-Wan ignited his lightsaber. The old man was nothing like his former self. He was old. He'd gained weight and lost hair. For Vader, this could be an easy cakewalk, just like the time he crushed Eeth Koth. Vader approached carefully and their duel began. Nothing nearly as flashy as the previous iterations of their combat. For the first time, especially because of Vader's patience, Obi-Wan could sense something he didn't before. On the moon outside Jabim and Mustafar, Vader's blind anger subdued any possibility for emotions to be noticed, but his calm and patient demeanor revealed something, the same something he saw for a moment in their last fight. Vader wasn't all corrupting or all powerful. There was a remnant of Anakin Skywalker left within him. Obi-Wan upon learning this could do one of two things. He could sacrifice himself in front of Luke to give a sense of inspiration to young Skywalker in the hopes that he could use it as a motivator, or he could do something else. His original plans folded and Obi-Wan began to take the duel much more seriously. To call it a duel was ironic. It mirrored a spar between two of them that they would have shared when Anakin first began his lightsaber training. The two of their blades beat back at each other until they were in front of the Millennium Falcon, Vader's blade striking delicately, trying to land its mark. Since the duel started, the two of them hadn't said a word to each other, and this was the opportunity, now or never. Kenobi spoke up. He told Vader that there was something left of Anakin Skywalker. He needed to stop resisting the pull back. Vader saw this as weakness on his own part, and he raged, swinging violently and barely missing. Obi-Wan moved on his feet. His tired old body could only manage so much in the form of combat. He turned around and Vader lifted his blade and slammed down on Obi-Wan, throwing him back against the wall. Vader beat down heavily again and again, Obi-Wan barely holding on to his lightsaber above himself. But he wasn't fighting back, something Vader had two choices to confront. He wanted to beat Kenobi into oblivion, but he wasn't even fighting back. What would his victory be worth if he couldn't kill him fair and square? As their blades smashed together again, Obi-Wan said that Anakin's family was still alive. This didn't exactly hit home either. Vader raged and his blade crushed through the wall amid Obi-Wan ducking out of the way. His deep, angry voice rang out, demanding to know why Obi-Wan would say that. As Obi-Wan regathered himself, he looked to the side. Running out of the corridor was, well, Anakin's family. The two droids, C-3PO and R2-D2, a young boy with a moisture farmer's outfit, a smuggler, a Wookiee, and a princess. Was Han Solo his son? No, that couldn't be. He turned back to Obi-Wan, who held his blade in front of his face, preparing for the next barrage. A grouping of stormtroopers came running up to watch this fight. Vader kept his lightsaber in front of him, but his eyes closed inside the mask. He knew he felt a connection, but he just assumed he was mistaken. Obi-Wan simply said the word, 
twins, and Anakin's eyes shut open. He looked over and saw both Luke and Leia looking in their direction. It couldn't be true. There's no feasible way for it to be possible. Kenobi waited for Skywalker to attack again, but he didn't. He deignited his weapon. Vader reached his arm out, and the few stormtroopers that all gathered dropped to the floor under the cracks of the neck snapping. Vader looked at Obi-Wan and told him to leave. Obi-Wan looked at Vader and stepped out of the corridor using the force to close it, just as another group of stormtroopers came up to Vader. Obi-Wan simply said their names. Luke and Leia. He made his way back to the Falcon and joined the two twins as they escaped from the Death Star. Vader told the men to ensure they chased down the Falcon and dealt with the rebels. They all agreed and they got the blast doors open and the Falcon was already gone. Vader on the other hand went into his personal quarters. There was one built for him inside of the Death Star, just as there was a throne room for the Emperor. The moment Vader got to his quarters he sat down in the seat and removed his helmet. His pale white skin was revealed and on his face a tear slid down. Luke and Leia rang out in his ears. There is no feasible way Obi-Wan could know that. Those were two names that he and Padme came up with. They decided they didn't want to know if it was a boy or a girl, so they just decided on two names. It was a couple nights before Order 66 and before everything changed. Anakin wiped a tear from his eye. They were twins, and their names were the same names as the ones picked out for them by their parents. Anakin firstly had to get over the astronomical odds that both of his droids, his apparent twins, and his former master were brought to him by some smuggler. He then pondered the reality and the gravity of the situation. Surely this couldn't be true, but even his heart couldn't deny it. He felt a sense of familiarity with Leia when he was torturing her, and then it clicked. He may have made a little oopsie. He kind of destroyed his daughter's home world after torturing her for hours. Did this mean that Reva brought him his daughter some 10 years beforehand? So many questions and not enough answers. How at all was any of this possible? Vader broke off from his train of thought when he received a message from Tarkin that they were going to the Yavin system to deal with the rebels once and for all. Vader had to make a choice here. He could not make a choice. So he waited ever so patiently inside of his meditation chambers as the Death Star made its way for the Yavin system. Vader couldn't just betray the Empire because his master would kill him. Of course he could kill his master, however, there was an issue of what would happen if he did. The entire Empire would fall into his hands. Fear crept over his body. Was he in too far? Could he escape this purgatory he placed himself in? It didn't seem like there was any way for him to break free of this. An overbearing pain washed over him. Would that be the last time he ever saw his children? Vader then decided to try something. Both he and Kenobi had a connection to the Force after their encounter on Mapuzo. When Vader burned his former master, he connected to him when they both entered their respective Bacta tanks. So that's what Vader tried here. He never tried reaching out to his former master before, and that occasion was just simply incidental, because Obi-Wan was opening back up to the Force, and he was much easier for Vader to feel through the Force. This time would be different. Obi-Wan no longer hit his essence, so maybe it was possible. Vader closed his eyes. He could feel hyperspace flying past them as the Death Star began its journey from the debris of Alderaan to the Avan system. He closed his eyes and dug deep. He couldn't feel anything. Was he too far into the dark side of the Force? Please, his thoughts begged, please don't let this be the end. As he then locked in, he could feel Obi-Wan, and his master could feel him. Obi-Wan over the years learned more about the Force itself, and so he opened up a vision for the two of them. Not quite the ability to see each other in the moment, but where they could hear each other and feel each other in a vision of sorts. Vader asked if it was true, to which Obi-Wan asked if he believed it was. For the first time since their last exchange, Obi-Wan heard Anakin again. It was his voice, without the husk of Vader surrounding it. Anakin told his former master that he didn't know what to believe. He wanted to believe that Padme still lived on, but he couldn't be sure. He wanted to be what his children needed him to be, but he was so incapable of reconciling with them. He gave the order to blow up Leia's home world. He gave the order to have Owen and Brew executed. Sure, Luke didn't know about that, but he had to live with it. Could he even bear to hide that truth from his son? Obi-Wan simply said Padme lives on through her beliefs. The children are the epitome of such beliefs. Change must come from within. It cannot be externally forced into him. Obi-Wan told Vader that every choice he made led him to this point in his life. He couldn't pin the blame anywhere else. So what would he do? Obi-Wan was in all fairness free to say this because Anakin excused him of the burden that was the fall of Anakin Skywalker, suggesting that he was responsible for Vader's construction. So if he was responsible for the death of Anakin Skywalker, could he become responsible for the death of Darth Vader and the rebirth of Anakin? Silence filled the vision, and Obi-Wan simply ended his side of the vision, cutting himself back off from Skywalker and allowing him to wallow in the silence, not just in the room, but in his heart. He did this, and he could be the only one to undo it, right? 
Anakin looked at the walls in his meditation chamber. He was often plagued with the voices of the Jedi he helped slaughter, calling out at all of them. He now sat here, and nothing spoke, not a breath of air or familiarity. He had nothing but himself to blame for his actions. The actions that got Padme killed, the actions that had both Luke and Leia's adopted families slaughtered, and the actions that landed him here, beneath the throne of Emperor Palpatine. The Death Star emerged from hyperspace, and it wasn't for another several minutes that alarms would begin to sound off in the superstructure. Vader rose to his feet and gathered up a group of fighters to take the battle to the rebels. In space, Vader was flanked by two ace pilots, but he wasn't even feeling like himself. He told the pilots to break off, and they both did. The rebel fighters were struggling badly. Vader could see that, and then he could see and feel a disturbance coming from the trench. He sped his ship over and saw two of the ace pilots chasing down a singular X-Wing. In the back of the ship he saw the blue astromech he saw earlier in the Death Star hangar bay, the same one that he hadn't seen since he told him to stay with the ship on Mustafar. Rage took over, but it wasn't Vader's rage, it was Anakin's. He grabbed the hold of the handles on his ship and blasted both of the ace pilots out of the sky without missing a beat, and before the Falcon could tear Vader out of the trench, he whipped the ship up and Luke was given a free shot. Vader piloted away from the Death Star as fast as he could and made his way for Yavin 8. Behind him, the superstructure exploded, killing everyone inside. The rebels, on the other hand, were free to return to Yavin 4 where their base was. The celebration for the rebels finished with Han and Luke receiving medals for having destroyed the Death Star. This battle, especially after the Battle of Scarif, could be the turning point for the Alliance during this conflict. When the celebrations finished, Obi-Wan told Luke and Leia that he was going to bring them to Yavin 8 for a moment. He wanted them to meet someone. They were confused, but they obliged, having Han Solo take them inside the Millennium Falcon to the other moon. It was one of the only three habitable moons on the Yavin system. When they landed, they saw an Imperial TIE fighter. Not a normal one, but an advanced TIE fighter. Obi-Wan told Luke and Leia that there were some things left out for their safety, but it seemed as if it was a safe time to do it now. Obi-Wan walked down the ramp and sat on a log with Darth Vader. His mask was on the ground. Luke and Leia were beyond confused at this. Leia truthfully was wholeheartedly pissed, though she was confused why they were brought here to see Darth Vader. Did Obi-Wan defeat him? Vader's helmet lay on the ground, and when the three exited the ship, he looked up. Obi-Wan saw yellow eyes when he last fought his student, but they were no longer yellow. At least they didn't seem that way from the distance. Vader looked up, trying to find the words to say. He thought about what he could say, and not a single word came to mind. His mind went blank. It turns out he didn't have to say a word, because Leia, seeing him in a weakened position, stormed forward. He didn't try to defend himself, he just watched her, and before he could react or flinch, she threw a bald fist into his face. It definitely didn't feel good, but he couldn't blame her. Obi-Wan sat on the ramp next to R2 as he rolled down next to him. They watched everything unfold in front of them. Anakin looked up and asked simply for a moment of their time, before they got hostile at least. Luke and Leia looked at each other. Han and Chewie watched from the cockpit, trying to figure out what was going on. Anakin didn't present him in a physically strong way. He winded through his words and then came to the simple truth. He told them that they were his twins, and that he was their father. Both of them were meant to be named by him and Padme, but they never had the opportunity to do so together. And for the first time in a long time, Anakin took accountability, telling his children that it didn't happen because of them. His actions ruined their chance for a happy family, and he told them that he was sorry. Leia looked back at Obi-Wan, almost with a clare, and he simply nodded his head. She didn't know who to be more mad at, obviously Vader, but she was still furious. This was a big secret to keep, to be the daughter of a man who not more than 24 hours before destroyed a planet of 2 billion, not to mention all the countless crimes he committed against literally any other breathing being in the galaxy. She began to pace back and forth. Luke turned back and asked if his father was killed by Darth Vader. Before Obi-Wan could answer, Anakin spoke up, telling him that it's word for word what he told Obi-Wan before. If that's what he said to him, then he wholeheartedly believed it to be true. It wasn't like Obi-Wan to outright lie. Anakin may have been twisting the truth here just a little, considering Obi-Wan did fake his death, but he was living in a state of euphoria, so he kind of neglected those memories. Luke turned his head back towards his sister, and then to Anakin. Leia turned back to Obi-Wan and asked if what he told her was true about her father. Obi-Wan nodded his head. She turned back and looked at this man, the man credited for being passionate, fearless, and forthright. Maybe he was at one point, but not right now. Anakin stood up, slowly as to not alert the two of them. Both Luke and Leia had their mother's height genes. Anakin looked at the two of them, taking a deep breath and telling them that he didn't expect them to forgive him. He didn't expect the galaxy to forgive him. He was a criminal, a master of genocide. He ushered in an era of terror, and those were things that could not just be forgiven. Obi-Wan watched Anakin stand in front of his children. He stood tall, and he didn't buckle. His heart was in the right place, but when his actions followed suit, 
Anakin dropped the lightsaber that belonged to Darth Vader. He told them that he was giving up his life as Darth Vader. He couldn't allow the dark side to control him anymore. He wasn't two people, he was one, and he was allowing his negative thoughts to not just cloud his judgment, but to cloud him as an individual. He could no longer allow that to be the case. Anakin turned his attention to Obi-Wan, and he said to his former master that he was thankful for him. He may have never shown it, but he wanted Obi-Wan to truly believe that he was thankful for him. Leia stopped and looked at Anakin. She turned her head away before they could lock eyes. Part of her wanted to understand him, to ask how or why he did what he did, but the rest of her wanted to be angry at him for eternity. Everyone on her homeworld was dead. She knew she was adopted, but they were her people. She was a princess of Alderaan. She was an Agana, and standing before her, was her father. Luke, on the other hand, while not being aware that Owen and Brood died because of his father, didn't know how to process it. Unlike his sister, his entire homeworld didn't explode. The galaxy felt so small now. A sister that was a princess, a hermit that was a Jedi Master, and a father who was a war criminal. What else could be missing? Luke looked at the lightsaber on the ground and asked what his father was planning. Anakin looked at his son and told him he needed to right his wrongs. But he would not do it as a Sith, he would do it as a Jedi. Luke reached down to his belt and grabbed his father's lightsaber and looked at it, and then handed it to Anakin. The two of them held eye contact for a moment. Anakin raised his mouth into a slight smile. There was an awkward tension here, but there was also something else. Anakin told the two of them that he was sorry. He apologized for missing each of their big moments in life. All the events, birthdays, good times, and hard times. He was sorry he wasn't there for them. He then told them that no matter what comes next, he will always be with them, as long as they want him to be there. Luke nodded his head, but Leia, still filled with anger, had a tear slide down her cheek. She resented this man, but she could still feel that he was her father. He noticed a tear slip from her eyes, and he reached out his hand to her and asked if she was okay. She turned her head away from him and looked at the ground beneath her. She spoke, but her voice was coarse. She told him that she could never forgive him for killing her family. Both of her parents, the aunts and uncles, annoying and friendly cousins, all of her friends that all died on Alderaan, she couldn't forgive him for that. He killed hundreds in a single sitting, and he was the most evil man in the galaxy. She stopped, catching her breath. Luke walked over to her side and put his hand on her shoulder. Anakin stood motionly with a tear bubbling in his eye. He now, for the first time, got to see what his actions caused, especially to those he loved. He waited. She was going to say something that would likely rip his heart out. She turned to Luke and put her hand on his hand, which was gently placed on her shoulder. It was at the very least a little bit of comfort. Leia told her father that he may not have been able to undo everything he did, but if he could do anything, then maybe he could change what the future held for everyone. She looked away from Anakin. He stood with his former lightsaber sitting in his hands, and he thought about the words as they entered his ears, playing over and over again. Leia wiped another tear away from her face and she looked at Anakin. Their eyes locked and he blinked, releasing a multitude of tears. Anakin told his son and daughter that all he wanted was to make the galaxy for them better than the one that they were raised in. He would die to ensure they no longer face subjugation. He placed the lightsaber on his belt and walked over to his helmet and reached for it, picking it up out of the dirt and brushing it off. Anakin turned to his children and told them that he may have not known them their entire lives, but for a short moment, he felt like he'd known them for eternity. This moment right here, he would relive in his moment until his final breath. Anakin looked at his helmet, and before he could put it on, the child who showed the most distaste toward him said his name. Anakin was lifting the helmet over his head when he stopped, and he looked over at Leia. She told Anakin that while she didn't forgive him, and that she didn't love him, that she would at the very least like to say goodbye to her father. She never got a chance to say goodbye to her loved ones on Alderaan, and she knew she would regret it here. Anakin lowered his helmet and nodded his head, without saying a word. They looked at each other and took a couple steps forward, and wrapped their arms around the other. Leia choked on her tears, and when they released each other, Anakin turned to Luke. His son had his arms open and gave his father a hug as well. When they broke off, Obi-Wan and R2 made their way over to Anakin, and Obi-Wan put his hand on Anakin's shoulder. He told him that the Force will be with him, always. Anakin looked at Obi-Wan and thanked him for never giving up on him, even all the way to the Death Star. Anakin then said that he would never be able to thank him for taking care of his children, but he would never forget what Obi-Wan went through for his family. Obi-Wan nodded his head, and Anakin raised his helmet over his own head before patting R2 and then walking back to the ship and getting into it. Leia and Luke stood next to each other, holding on to each other as if the other one was holding them up. Obi-Wan made his way over to the twins and asked if they were alright. Their answer was unsure. Truthfully, how could they know? They all watched as Vader's TIE advanced fighter lifted off into the air and departed. Obi-Wan put his arms around the twins and told them that he would guide them 
from here on out with everything. He grabbed Vader's blade and they went back to the Falcon. The Alliance was shifting all of its troops from Yavin 4 to another planet out of the way in the Outer Rim territories. The intention was to get as far away as they could from Yavin 4 to protect their secrecy. Meanwhile, Vader was returning the Coruscant to inform his master that the Death Star failed. When Vader arrived in the Emperor's office, he found Sidious to be very disappointed. He already knew the Death Star failed. He could feel it through the Force. He was also very angry that the entire facility was destroyed with some of his most loyal servants and Vader was the sole survivor. What a coincidence. Vader was intending to play the long game. He knelt before Palpatine's desk when his master got up and walked around the side of it. He expressed his anger with Vader's lack of results, putting the Empire back by years by allowing the Rebels to continue to gallivant across the galaxy. Lightning rang out from Sidious's fingers, shocking Vader and forcing him down onto both of his knees. His body ached in pain with lightning covering it. He cried out in pain and Sidious began to call Vader out as a failure. Sidious stopped and told Vader that he was very disappointed. The Inquisitorious were failures because they weren't strong force users, so how could Vader be so flawed? He'd been given more than enough second chances. How many times was he defeated by a Jedi and needed saving? How many times did he allow a group of rebels to escape under his fingertips? It was ridiculous. Sidious shot more lightning into Vader's back. He had enough. Anakin rose, his suit crippling and caving in. Sidious didn't like Vader rising up against him, not one bit, so he shot more lightning into his back. Hissing as he did, seething in his rage, Anakin grabbed his Jedi lightsaber and held it under his body. Sidious didn't fear Vader, he simply continued to pour lightning into him, like he did every other time. But the words said to him by his daughter sat in the forefront of Anakin's mind. Nothing would deter him from allowing her and her brother to live in the galaxy free from his mistakes. Vader's helmet lifted and Sidious felt the shock in himself. Vader reached out his hand and his metal glove gripped Sidious's cloak. He pulled him closer and a blue lightsaber ignited through Palpatine's stomach. The pain was jolting. Sidious tried to focus on an essence transfer. He knew Vader's suit was crippled. It would only be a matter of time until he died here in this office. If he could get out, nothing would stop him. But he could couldn't escape. Anakin's blade pulled upwards and out, before he threw it back into Sidious's body to ensure his death, which came very swiftly. Vader fell back to the ground, his body too heavy to hold up any longer. He leaned against Palpatine's desk and removed his helmet. He pulled out a recording device and held it up, and it projected a hologram recording. Anakin then made sure it showed Palpatine's dead body. He then spoke to it. He breathed heavily, his body hardly able to produce enough oxygen for him to breathe with. Being that he was in Palpatine's office, he made sure that the galaxy saw it. He spoke to it, fading in and out of consciousness, introducing himself as Anakin Skywalker, former Jedi Knight during the Republic. He told the galaxy that Palpatine was a leech. He ripped everything good away from the galaxy and so Anakin killed him. He continued telling the galaxy that the Empire was producing a number of superstructures, and one of them was just destroyed outside of Yavin by a group of brave rebels. Anakin coughed up blood, and then took another deep breath. He told everyone that the Empire was not to be trusted, that the Empire is not their friends. The weapon outside of Yavin destroyed Jeddah City, obliterated Alderaan, and would have done the same to Yavin. Anakin told the people that it was time to rise up. Without the Emperor or without Darth Vader, the Imperial military structure would be weak. The officers would vie for power in their own self-interest. Anakin told the people that it was their time, and then taking a note out of Marva Karasi Andor's book, he told the people to fight the Empire. Before he was finished, he told the people of the galaxy that he wanted a better future for generations to come, and with his dying breath, he told the galaxy that he loved his children with all that he was. He then died. The transmission remained open for several minutes until the Emperor's guard ran into the room and turned off the transmission. The Rebels would see this transmission, and most importantly, the twins would too. They were still struggling with processing this. Obi-Wan did explain it to them why their decisions were made, like Bail Organa suggesting to take Leia, and that Yoda suggesting Luke go to the Lars homestead. They expressed their individual desire to have time away from Obi-Wan, which he understood. He had a good connection with both of them, but they equally felt like they were lied to in some sense, so their trust for him wasn't exactly outstanding at the moment. Obi-Wan stayed on the Rebel base while Han, Chewie, Luke, and Leia went out into the galaxy. Luke and Leia were able to pick up on their twin-like relationship and start to develop it naturally, which went really well for them, especially since they found out only a couple hours after they met. The two of them enjoyed their friendship with the smuggler and the Wookiee. The group was really well-rounded, and without thinking about how their father was Darth Vader, it was much easier. But it was still a reality that they had to face everywhere they went. The moment the Emperor was revealed as dead and the second Darth Vader died, the floodgates opened. The Empire was strong and it was everywhere, but Vader's message was played to every single one of the four quadrillion sentients across the entire galaxy, and everything changed. 
Imperial officers without leadership turned on each other. It also didn't help that the last several months had Grand Admiral Thrawn disappearing over Lothal, Director Krennic killed on Scarif, and the reports of Yularen, Tarkin, and a number of other Imperial officers being killed over Yavin were pouring in. So, in through the ranks rose a cutthroat member of the Imperial ISB. She had staked her claim as a favorite amongst her peers in the ISB, but there was one small issue. She was unknown. ISB agents were kept under the radar, so she took it upon herself to challenge those in her way. The reality of the situation is she would make a fine addition. However, Admiral Garrick Verzio of the ISB was in her way, and with his daughter a member of the Imperial Special Forces, it would put a target on her back. While moths in the Outer Rim and Midrims vied for power, Dedra planted an assassin on Admiral Verzio's flagship and dispatched him and his daughter. Iden Verzio. The incident kind of had the ship self-destruct and kill all on board. It was fine. It gave Dedra the power to rise to the ranks of the Imperial military, but by the time she got to the top, it was far too late. Moffs and Grand Admirals descended upon Coruscant and all-out war began. The Rebels didn't actually need to do anything but just watch. However, they did continue to contribute as much as they could. They liberated people and helped pop up rebellions elsewhere in the galaxy. There were more people against the Empire than it originally seemed, and without leadership, there was nothing for the Empire to use. Masameda, the Grand Vizier of the Empire, tried to hold things together until he was assassinated by another one of the nameless individuals running around trying to seize control of the Empire. With so much chaos unfolding, Obi-Wan took Darth Vader's crystal and decided to try something with it. He spent a lot of time alone without the twins nearby, so he worked on the crystal and tried to purify it. It took a lot of time, but he was at peace with himself, and so he's able to break the crystal into halves and prepare two separate lightsabers with purified blades for the twins. When they returned several months later, at the culmination of the Galactic Civil War, Obi-Wan told them that he understood they might have a lack of trust for him, but he had something for them. They had mostly gotten over the whole Vader thing and truthfully were beginning to take a fresh look at their lives as the children of Anakin Skywalker and Padme Amidala. Leia refused to take Anakin's last name, and while she wasn't born an Agana, she'd rather be that, as she identified more with the family that raised her. Luke, on the other hand, kept his last name, because Luke Lars didn't really have a good ring to it anyways. However, much like his sister, he tried to distance himself from what his father had done for the last 20 years. Both of them wanted to create their own legacy, ones that differed from the ones created by their father. Regardless, Obi-Wan's gift to them was the remains of Vader's lightsaber, purified and broken up for them. He told the two of them that they didn't need to take it, and they didn't need the train to become Jedi, but if they had any interest in doing so, then it would be his honor to see them through their training to the end. If they didn't take it, then the Jedi would die. The twins looked at each other, pondering over what they would do. Luke took a step forward first. He initially showed interest in becoming a Jedi like his father before him, and now he would fulfill that. Luke grabbed the lightsaber from Ben and turned around. Leia looked at her brother and then the Obi-Wan. She, since the day she met Obi-Wan, had a special bond with him, similar to father-daughter. She was upset at him, but by this point understood why it was kept as a secret from her when she was 10. Who tells a 10-year-old their biological father killed their biological mother and then committed a mass genocide for funsies? She took the lightsaber, and Obi-Wan smiled at them, telling the two of them that he was looking forward to completing their training. Luke and Leia would continue helping people around the galaxy, but every time they returned to Obi-Wan, they'd be given a new leg of their Jedi training. Something they could individually work on when they went out into the galaxy to do good for the people in the galaxy. During these missions, Obi-Wan would become more and more one with the Cosmic Force, where he could hear the voices from every Jedi that came before him. This was something completely different than Force Ghosts, and he enjoyed the delight in hearing voices from the past speak to him. He also learned that Anakin had been able to find peace through the Force and thanks to Qui-Gon, had the opportunity to become a Force Ghost. Each of Obi-Wan's lessons could be practiced away from him without his overseeing, and he did his best to allow Luke and Leia out of the Rebel base for the time they needed. He taught Anakin. He was a pro with teaching Skywalkers, and when he learned that Leia was infatuated with Han, Obi-Wan was accepting of this. Her decision was her decision. In fact, after all this time, maybe it was time for the Jedi to welcome change into their code. Kenobi suggested that the future of the Order belonged to Luke and Leia, and so if it belonged to them, anything he did to negate that would either bite them in the back in the future, or just be done by the time Yoda and him died. So why fight it? Obi-Wan, during an extended break, would take Luke and Leia to Dagobah to finish their training with Yoda. While they were with Yoda, the Empire would finish itself off at the Battle of Kuat, where two of the largest Imperial fleets converged, and in a show of unity, the Alliance along with just people showed up. People sounds vague, but they showed up, from all corners of the galaxy to finish off the Empire, and they did. No sign of Remnant would be visible as the Empire imploded from the inside out. The Rebellion moved on Coruscant and began to rebuild with Mon Mothma at the helm. 
Due to Leia's relation to Vader, she wouldn't have the chance to join the New Republic. So instead, she, Luke, and Han went to construct a Jedi temple. Han wasn't really in love with the idea, but when you're head over heels for someone, you make sacrifices for the ones you love. Obi-Wan would assist them with finding some notable documents he collected over the years, including a map to every known Jedi temple in the galaxy. Obi-Wan told them that they could rebuild from these, but the Order now belonged to them. With a bright future ahead of them, Luke and Leia would restructure the Jedi Order around their own core beliefs of what should become a Jedi, and Obi-Wan would find peace with all of it until his own natural death. With two instructors, students would be brought into the Jedi Order at a quicker rate. This would have Leia's relationship with Han on the back burner for a hot minute as well. But when she felt the time was right, the two of them would have Ben Solo. With Palpatine's death coming so soon, his cloning facilities would be left in ruins. However, his non-Force-sensitive clone named Dathan, that he released years before from Exegol, would go on to have a child of his own in 15 ABY. The child would eventually join the Jedi on Osis. Among the class of talented Jedi were Ben, Rey, and Grogu. Their instructors would lead them on a path set forward by the Jedi. Outside of the Jedi's rebuilding would be the return of Ezra Bridger and Grand Admiral Thrawn. But with no Shadow Council, barely any remnant, and no First Order, Thrawn's return would be short-lived. Ezra, on the other hand, would join back up with his friends in the Ghost Crew, while Ahsoka went to Osis to meet Luke and Leia before she continued her own journeys across the ever-changing galaxy. And that is our story. Again, special thanks to Galvin Gaming, Tristan, Darth Riven, Pimp Daddy Bane, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Jedi Sloth, and the Cease, Mad Many Studios, Jack Miller, Anakin 003, Lemon Knight, Rex the Wolf, The Man with Three First Names, Dark Saint 46, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. If you want your name up here, go check out the Patreon if you want to support me in other ways. Let's talk about the story. So this is something that hasn't been done before, and I always try and do something that hasn't been done before, and I think this one is something special. Now off the bat, it kind of sounds a little goofy. You know, old man Ben coming up and saying, yo, what if we just didn't fight? There's a couple comments in yesterday's post about what comes out today, and uh, I, I thought they were pretty funny. I thought about that when I was editing it, I was just like, yeah, that's that's pretty funny. Uh, shout out to you guys. But no, for this story, I wanted to take the concept of, of what sounds really initially goofy, and really build an emotional story out of it. Most of the emotional stories, the very emotional stories on this channel, have to do with Anakin and Obi-Wan's relationship, the Master and Apprentice Bond, and I really wanted to focus on that here. I've done What If Anakin Was Saved on, I think Mustafar, I think I did that one, and What If Obi-Wan Saved Him on the Moon Outside of Jabim, and so I really wanted to see what would happen here, and I think it changes the game, you know? And I don't want to give Anakin a free pass, because honestly, after 20 years of genocide, you don't really get a free pass, you know? That just, like, you just don't get a free pass after that, and so I, I kind of corrected a wrong that I made in one of my previous installments, uh, what if Vader survived Return of the Jedi, and I think here, I think I allowed it to develop a little bit more naturally, a little bit more realistically, but also with a sense of emotion, and I really wanted to subvert your own expectations with Leia kind of finding a moment to have peace with Vader and Anakin, instead of her being the one to, to be the last one to him. And I wanted that moment between Luke, Leia, and Anakin to feel very vulnerable and feel very right, if that makes sense. I wanted to feel emotional, but not where it's like you're going overboard, you know? And that's a very delicate thing because you can't go too overboard with something like that. And I, I, I believe I hit it just right. So I hope you all enjoyed. If you did, you know what to do. We got some bangers coming out in July, so you know what to do. Smash the like button, share the videos, all that stuff. Anyways, I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the force be with you.